everything. Um, you're doing all of that. I just read yeah, the you scripture. Just, yeah, you just have the scripture this morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Central and Algonquin United Methodist Church's worship service on this beautiful sixth day of June. I'm Vicki Hadaway, the pastor of the two churches, and we greet you on this beautiful morning. We're glad you're with us. If you're joining us online and you have a prayer request for later, please put that in the chat box so that one of our hosts can get that to me. And if you're here in the sanctuary and you have a prayer request, there are blue cards in the pews. You could write that prayer request on that and raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring that up to me. The mission of Algonquin and Central United Methodist Churches is connecting all people to God by building bridges of caring, outreach, and acceptance. Let us worship the Lord. Please stand on your feet or in your heart. Oh, give thanks to the Lord with your whole heart. On the day I call, you answer me. God's steadfast love endures forever. Thanks be to God. Our opening song is Morning Has Broken, 145.
seated. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Psalms, number 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the God, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I call, you answer me. You increase my strength and my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For the, though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, the third chapter, verses 20 to 35. Mark 3, 20 to 35. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man, then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sin and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Here ends our reading. Will you pray with me, please? Holy and living God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be a pleasing sacrifice to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So my title this morning is Embracing a Larger Family. Embracing a Larger Family. I'm sorry I don't always get that done in time uh, for my efficient uh, administrative assistant, but hallelujah for that, right? My paternal grandfather, my dad's father, was a Methodist minister, Alfred Landon. He actually served in the Detroit Conference beginning in 1926 until 1966 when he retired. He served at Brighton, Jackson, Bayport, Richmond, Trinity and Flint, Madison Avenue and Bay City, and Mount Clemens. From 1949 to 1954, he was the district superintendent for, this, uh, for the uh, Saginaw district, and my father, which includes the UP. And my father remembers driving on some weekends with his dad as he would come up here and visit the churches. He served at Calvary UMC in Detroit, Fenton, where he retired, and then as an associate at Central UMC in retirement in Flint. And that's where I have the most memories. Fenton and Flint is where I have the most memories of him. I say all this to say to you that my grandfather was a good Methodist. Both he and my grandmother 
no drinking, no swearing, no smoking. Now these good Methodist traits didn't necessarily translate to the next generation and the generation after that. Well, you know, we were young. At least not while we were all young, I'll say. Now, I was not a football fan when I lived here, and so I don't want you to get mad at me, but I have never been a Detroit Lions fan. I just never have. And um, when I was in, in the 1970s, we moved up here, and I started watching football with my father, and he explained all of it to me, and he said, well, you might as well pick a team. And so it was the 70s, so who did I pick? I picked the Steelers. And the Steelers were great for, what, 15 years or something. I loved watching them. And as it happened one day, we were at my grandparents after a big dinner, and we were watching football. Now, I'm a young teen, okay? And we're watching football, and somebody did something that was bad for the Steelers. And I went, oh, shh. <laughs> yeah. Now, my mother was like, from me to Jerry, over at the dining room table. And I immediately looked at her, and she at me, and boy, I got that. How could you do that? And then we looked at my grandfather, who had been watching the game with us. He hadn't moved. He didn't say a thing. Now, he was hard of hearing. <laughs> but if my mother heard it, I have a feeling he heard it. However, he never said anything to me. He probably saw that I was embarrassed and had wished that it hadn't even slipped out to begin with. But I think if he had been worried about my mortal soul, that he would have set me down and said something to me. But he never did. At the beginning of this morning's gospel, Jesus calls out those who blaspheme against him, against him and the Holy Spirit, and saying that they can never be forgiven for they are guilty of an eternal sin. We certainly must be careful about our language and how we speak of God. But these verses are not simply about swearing or taking the Lord's name in vain. The blasphemy is much more serious than this. We remember that those who opposed Jesus claimed that his power to cast out demons came from Beelzebub, from the devil. In this instance, it was the scribes. Jesus was misrepresenting what they didn't understand. Jesus was not acting with their approval. Jesus was not adhering to the law of Moses, and so they labeled him as unclean. And the work and the healing work that he was doing is also unclean. Now, the radical changes that God was inviting the people to join into at the time that God brought through Jesus was never to destroy or to tear down, God's purposes have always been about building up and bringing about wholeness. It is us as human beings who tear each other down, who label what we do not understand or have not sanctioned. It is human beings who highlight statements about guilt and eternal sin. Is this what we should focus on this morning in this passage, or is there something else? In this section, it begins with Jesus' family trying to protect him. He had already begun to cause some murmurs among those in positions of power, and they knew that if he kept this up, they would arrest him and he would be hurt. The family in Jewish life is extremely important and valued. This is one of the reasons why, as we read the scriptures, genealogies attest to this importance as they list all of the names of the people. Religious instruction, economic vitality, and claims to the land were all tied to the family life. Families represented multiple generations and were also linked to specific tribes within Israel. There were tribes that were the priestly tribes, that were tribes that were the farmers, and different tribes had different roles. Family loyalty, family respect, and obedience were hallmarks of the Jewish family. But what we see already in Mark and throughout the Gospels is that Jesus 
is expanding this definition of family in radical ways, beginning by calling two sets of sons from their family business to leave their father to come and follow him. Jesus offers a definition of family that was shocking to his hearers of the time, subjecting kinship not to matters of biology or human loyalty, but to loyalty, respect, and obedience to God. The concept of an extended family had suddenly taken on much wider proportions. Jesus is not advocating hostility toward one's family. Jesus is making it clear, however, that loving God and following Jesus binds us together with others in ways more deeply than just those of our kin. Learning to love and care for those whom we are bound together in faith reorders our priorities and our resources. In the last couple weeks, People haven't been able to make it to a meeting, or I have needed to take a half a day off. And what we say to each other in these instances is always, family comes first. And that's true. It's always true. But what Jesus is saying to us is this family that I want you to think about coming first. Uh, defining family by Jesus is whoever does the will of God whoever does the will of God. And so who gets to decide who is doing God's will? Is it the scribes, the lawyers, the judges, the religious elite, a specific sect, the politicians, the family of origin, maybe the oldest Christian, maybe the richest Christian, or maybe the Christian that has the largest number of followers should be the one to decide what's God's will. We must remember that almost everyone misunderstood who Jesus was until after the fact. We certainly have read uh, history books and seen with our own eyes God's will used in ways that is not about building up, is not about a demonstration of love and compassion or justice. We note that Jesus did say that a house divided cannot stand. What does this mean for us in our time? I'm not saying that if you get married to someone that you should stick with them forever and ever if it's not working out. What I am saying, though, is that we make our best effort. We try our hardest. We put ourselves in a position to hear each other, to see each other. And if, after all that, it doesn't work out, then if we have to separate, we separate in a loving and compassionate way, a respectful way. Christianity right now is divided into so many fractions. In our own town, there are some who will not sit down with me and have a cup of coffee because I am a woman not even sit down to work on something for the good of our community. On the other hand, we've got Central Algonquin, Faith Lutheran, and First United Presbyterian working together to put together BBS this summer. Hard as it is to accept, each of us must admit that we see God through our own limited lens and experience. Let me say that again. As hard as it is to accept, each of us must admit that we see God through our own limited lens and experiences. We have, as followers of Jesus, a good idea about what it's going to look like when God brings about his kingdom. We, we, that's been drawn out for us. But what we don't know is how God is going to get us from here to there. We have a little bit of an idea, but we each have an idea of what that looks like. And we only see part of the story, a portion of God's humanity, even in our own lives. If we add to this that there are people that we don't understand, 
people that we don't like, people that we think who are wrong, or maybe people we even feel uncomfortable around, it adds to the confusion. Can we say to ourselves, I can love and respect you because you are following Jesus, you are doing what you believe is right and is the will of God as you understand it. Can we allow that and give that to each other? If we focus on our two congregations, if we not worry so much about this, but we, we focus on Algonquin and Central United Methodist Churches, this is where that vision piece that we've been working on is so helpful. Vision equals clarity, right? And so I suggest to us this morning that maybe a better question as to who gets to define God's will, maybe a better question for us is, how can we as Central United Methodists know who is to be a part of this Christian community that God is gathering in this place? How can we know who is to be a part of this Christian community that God is gathering in this place? One of the aspects of our vision is these values of why we're doing what we're doing. Kathy put those on the Facebook page uh, at Central, and then I posted them over on Algonquin. Five things that, that help us define why we, why we do what we're doing. And one of those is sincere welcome. Sincere welcome. That we want, when people walk into this church, to walk into Algonquin, we want them to feel that they are welcome. That to come in and find out who we are, tell us who you are, and let's do this thing together, right? We want them to feel, and we use these words, a part of the family. Now we know these things don't just happen, and we also know that not all families are healthy, open, and loving, and we also know that even the best of families have their struggles. If you think about what happens when you go down for fellowship time, we all kind of gravitate toward those that we always talk to, and especially now, as we're coming back together, we really gravitate toward those we know. And so what would it look like for us to make this, to live into this idea of a sincere welcome? Well, I want to use the image of a healthy family to identify a couple things. One, families eat together. Families eat together. When do you have your best conversations with your parents or with your kids or, or with your grandkids or even with a good friend? When you eat together, when you share a meal. It is, families are coming back together and reclaiming this sense the pandemic, realizing what they had been missing out on. Who did Jesus eat with? Actually, a better question is who didn't he eat with because he ate with everyone. He ate with those who persecuted him. He ate with those who were trying to catch him in a lie. He ate with those who called him the devil. He ate with those he healed. He ate with everyone. And so should we. The second thing is that families support each other even when they disagree. When we disagree or we don't understand, we, we, we don't gossip about the other one, we aren't disrespectful of each other's, or even worse, we don't just walk away. We try to work things out. And we do that by taking the time to try to learn why the other person is doing what they're doing. Hey, I don't understand. Can you help me to try to better understand? We don't send people away. June is Pride Month. And when you leave the church today, if you, when you walk out and you'll be on Spruce Street, if you look up into the Huntington Bank on the second floor, there's all kinds of posters and things for pride, the um, rainbow is the symbol of pride. And during Pride Month, we are asked to celebrate the wide diversity of human expressions that God has created. 
right now in our society, instead of hiding in the closet or carrying one of the many labels that are used to describe them, many unclean, more and more individuals are embracing who God created them to be. They'll tell you if you ask them that they don't have it all figured out, but they are willing to be real and to put their questions and struggles out there so that they can find some answers and maybe so that they can help others to find answers too. Around our country, legislators are passing laws about sports, about bathrooms, even access to, men to medical care based on someone's sexuality. And this isn't aimed at adults, this is aimed at kids, teenagers, children. What is our role as the church? How many of us know someone who is not heterosexual and how would you even know if they were to begin with? One of the easiest ways to learn about someone you have no connection with or no understanding is to take the time to learn their story. So there's a project called the Gender Cool, J-E-N-D-E-R-C-O-O-L project that is led by teenagers and they are bringing positive change into the world. They are helping to replace misinformation with positive experience so that people can see them beyond this limited scope about their sexuality. They are writing books. They are telling their story. They're telling other people's stories. They are tackling complex issues, racism, anxiety, body image, and cancer. They want to be seen as who they are, not what they are. Friends, families support each other. They don't walk away or send people away because they disagree. My girlfriend Lois, who you all know, had a church in Chicago, Broadway United Methodist. Teenagers were getting kicked out of their house because of their sexuality and were living on the streets and they started a ministry once a week to have a safe place for these children to come. Number three, in families there are chores, responsibilities for the benefit of the family. Those of you who were born in my generation know that the boys got off easy and the girls had all the chores. Can I get an amen? Right? My brother had to take out the garbage. And on Saturday, my list was pretty long, you know? But on the other hand, I was the oldest, I babysat. And I would have friends that would say to me, well, how come you have to babysit all the time? And you know what my response was? Because that's my job. I took it seriously. That's what my parents had instilled in me. That was my role that I had to play. And the Christian church is the same. In 1 Corinthians, what does Paul call us? He calls us the body of Christ, the hand, not more important than the foot, the arm, not more important than the eye, all working together to strengthen the body of Christ, this body. Everyone has a role to play. Everyone has a chore to do, whether you're brand new, whether you've been here for a long time whether you don't even know what that might be or whether you might want to try something new. And I'm just going to say this. The pandemic is coming to an end and some of us are relying on just a few good people to do all the work. Friends, you got to get up off of your butts and start helping out. We need to come alongside of each other. And then as we go out into community, work together with others for the common good. As we work alongside new people, this is how our family grows and expands. Now by now, most of you have gotten my June newsletter and hopefully read it, including my pastor letter. In it, I describe how I am responding to God's invitation to serve as a volunteer chaplain in the auxiliary chaplain service. 
this is not something i sought out in fact when i was asked i was quite confused but the more time i spend with the auxiliary and with the coast guard and with the enlisted personnel i find myself extending my understanding of who is a part of my our family families eat together they support each other, especially when there are disagreements. And families, everybody has a responsibility to strengthen the family. Lastly, families share what they love with each other. Families share what they love with each other. Let me go back to my grandfather for a minute. Alfred and my grandmother's name was Martha Landon. We're best friends with Howard and Sylvia Burden, who was also a Methodist minister in the Detroit Conference. In their younger days, they would go to Boyne Falls, specifically Lake Louise Camp, and go camping as young couples. One trip, it rained and rained, and the guys said to the girls, we're going to go out for a drive. Well, they went for a drive, and they happened on Pickerel Lake, which I googled it, is 26 miles. At the time, which was 1931, farmers owned most of the lakefront property up here. And most farmers back in 1939 would tell you that the lakefront property was the hardest and the worst to farm. And so my grandfather and his best friend went to this farmer and they said, would you be willing to subdivide this little section of Pickerel Lake for us in 50 and 75 foot plots and sell it to us and our friends? And so he did. And so the, these Methodist preachers told their other friends and other Methodists, and before you knew it, up here on Pickerel Lake was this little Methodist enclave where there was no drinking, no swearing, and no smoking, for the first generation at least, right? Now, um, the farmer was was uh, Farmer Botsford. So Botsford Road is named after him and the original farm is still there. The farmhouse is still there and the lady who lives in it is a dear friend of ours. She's in her 80s, you know. Um, Reverend Walter Saxman was the pastor here. None of you will remember this. It was too far back, but 1950 to 1954 and he, you know, maybe a couple of you will remember. He, um, he had a cottage uh, along our, where our cottages are. So these were modest, these were preachers, these were modest little cottages. My dad grew up, spent his summers there. I grew up spending part of my summer there and now Martha and Alfred's great-great-grandchildren are spending part of their summer up there. My father gets more joy from seeing his great-grandkids and grandkids there than anything. Now we don't know all the people on the landing really well, but we know who they are and they know who we are because over the years, you know, people's relationships have shifted and changes, but we respect each other because we know of the lineage from which we came. Well, recently, a family sold their cottage to a doctor from downstate. Someone who didn't know the Botsford Landing way and didn't take the time to find out the history of it or anything, they tore down this modest cottage on a 75-foot lot and built a two-story brick house, cottage. It was really hard to get used to this, and I'm using this word intentionally, invasion. It was seemingly insensitive of them to do this among what we had always known. The house stuck out like you can imagine. It's been about five years now, and the Botsford folks are softening up to these newcomers. There still are some things that need to work out, like they've all got central air, but none of the cottages have central air, and at 10 o'clock at night, your neighbor's window is open because they're just trying to catch a breeze. And if you're outside and talking and partying, they're going to hear what you're saying. So still a couple things to work out. But they're softening up because they're getting to know this family. Like our ancestors, these folks just want to have a place to come. 
They want to have a place to bring their children and their grandchildren. They want to have a place to pass on to their ancestors. Just because they didn't adhere to the unwritten Bosford Landing rules doesn't make them any less deserving of this special place that we love. Families share their blessings. And so I say to us this morning, do you love this place? Do you love what God has done for you in this place and for your family? Do you think that what we are doing here is special and blessed? Then let's be willing to welcome those who are going to come, that God is going to bring. Let's be willing to welcome them sincerely with the understanding that God has a plan for us, that God has a plan, and it will be revealed to us if we will be willing to work together. It is this desire to follow Jesus that brings us together as a body. This desire to follow Jesus, this is why we are here. We are united in love and service, but that doesn't mean that we stop there. We need to always be growing. We need to be willing to make room for others, and we need to give of ourselves in sacrificial ways. This is what Jesus needs and expects of us as his family. Amen. into our time of prayer. I'll lift up a couple uh, prayers and then we'll move into an intercessory prayer this morning. Um, Marv DeWitt has a birthday tomorrow, so happy birthday Marv. And Hollis Taylor has a birthday on the 11th. Um, Bernita and Bob Sibbalt celebrate 34 years today. And you know what they're doing? They're coming to our picnic. So... We hope you've signed up to come. Um, so we pray for them and celebrate that with them. Uh, Becky Russo, who goes to the Algonquin Church, is a member of the Remnant Fellowship Church uh, down in Tennessee. 
their understanding of the will of God is significantly different than our understanding of the will of God as United Methodists. But they lost their pastor and their pastor to uh, a lake. And so we pray for them, the Remnant Fellowship Church, in this time of steep, deep sorrow. Prayers for Suzanne, Bev Atkins' cousin. Prayers for Bob LeCure and Diane Bell as they continue with uh, tests to find out what's going on at their health. Jim Sylvester is having a heart procedure on the 10th of June at Cleveland Clinic. We uh, pray for Joni Adkins, who had knee replacement surgery this past week, and she's doing pretty well. And Kirsty is a co-worker uh, with cancer for Bernita. We pray for Ralph Vert, who died this week, and for his family. And continue prayers for all who are healing from surgeries. And Tim Spence and Don Wilson wanted us to know that he's doing great after his hip replacement surgery. He's getting around really well. We saw him this week. So I want to say thank you to all of you who send the, your prayer requests, but also your updates so that we can share those with each other. Will you join me in prayer, please? God of creation, you set us in a beautiful place and gave us everything needful for an abundant life. Yet we have marred your good creation. Help us to always be mindful that the blessings of land and place that we so love have belonged to others before us and will belong to others after we are gone. Ultimately, the land and the places that we love do not belong to us at all. They belong to you and are on loan to us for a time. You have entrusted us with this earth and our place in it to be good stewards of the water, air, plants, and animals. Give us the grace to be the stewards you need us to be, not thinking only of ourselves, but of past and future generations. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we have also marred human relationships by emphasizing our differences and disagreements at the expense of our commonalities and connections. We pray that you will give us new understandings and ways of living with one another. Help us to do the slow work of peace rather than turning to the quick response of anger and rejection. Open our hearts to receive our differences as enrichments rather than deficits. Enable us to care for the last and the lost, not as unwanted burdens, but as welcome companions in your great household. Lord, in your mercy. Renewing God, we know so well that human life is fragile. We see in our own bodies how illnesses and infirmities afflict us. We come before you today to ask for healing, recovery, and an end to pain and suffering. We lift up the names of those we have mentioned out loud and those we carry on our heart. Lord, in your mercy. We are grateful, O oh God, that, through, that though our bodies fail us, you renew us spiritually day by day, so that we never outlive our usefulness to you. No need, no person is ever hidden from you or beyond your reach to save. Remember those we have overlooked, those whom we have forgotten or forsaken, and those who have wandered away from you. Restore them and restore us until we are all your family together in the bonds of Jesus in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. So, you're going to need to turn this down. Um, thank you. I'll just keep talking for a minute. There we go. I invite you to pull, uh, move on as we move to our communion liturgy. As we reflect on the Christian value of sincere welcome and that everyone is family, it is no coincidence that Jesus had his last supper sharing a meal with his apostles and that this is the sacrament that unites us with him when we come together. 
And so Christ invites to his table all who desire to know and to love him, who earnestly repent of our sins, and who seek to live in peace with one another. So please join me now as we acknowledge those things that have separated us from God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy upon us. You show us your wisdom. Our broken relationships with you and with one another. In your mercy, Christ has risen from the grave to bring us out of the shadow of death, to free us from all fear, and to liberate our souls in the newness of life. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. And so may God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. This day we are reminded that you created and are creating a world of diversity and change. You continue to invite your children into relationship with you. And so we join our voices in song as our ancestors have done before us to praise your name and join their unending hymn saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, blessed are you, O God, who created us to love one another and who calls us into covenant community. We come today gathered in gratitude and we remember. We remember that Jesus came from a family where Sabbath evenings were spent and where he ate at table with others. We remember that on his first day in the healing business, he lifted up a woman from her fever and she responded by serving everyone from the generosity of her wellness. Jesus sat and ate at her table. We remember that near the end of his ministry, he called a short man from a tree with a forgiveness so abundant it became a meal for the last and the lost. Jesus sat and ate at that table too. And we remember that Jesus knew when it was the last Passover how important healing and turning lives around was. And he blessed unleavened bread, he poured wine, and loving freely invite, is inviting us to always be here in this place. At this table, we are present with Jesus on the night in which he gave himself up for us. He took bread. And he gave thanks to you and he offered this bread to his disciples and he said take and eat all of you this is my body which is broken for you and for many do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me and likewise when the supper was over he took the cup and again he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and he said drink of this all of you this is the cup of the new covenant my blood poured out for you and for many do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in participation in this Holy Spirit and offer to make real the memory of Christ in the world, Christ is present for us so that we can be present for the world as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, Lord, and on these gifts of bread and cup. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, throughout your holy church and all creation, all honor and glory is yours now and forever. Amen. Will you please join me in saying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so we who are many are one because we partake of the one loaf, the body of Christ, broken for us. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. So I'm going to ask our ushers to please come forward. Uh, if you're joining us at home, you would want to get your communion elements out. And uh, please wait until we all have received the juice in the cup so that we can do them together. Pat? you to just peel back that top clear layer of your and take your little wafer out this is the body of Christ broken for us And then pull back that little purple one, which is a little harder. And this is the blood of Christ shed for us. You can put your little, there's little things in your pew there where you can put those. And so, friends, what shall we say after reception of God's gracious gift? Loving God, we thank you from the depth of our heart for your great love for us as expressed in the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we take this love we have received 
and share it with whomever we meet on our journey in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple announcements. Our picnic is over at Sherman Park today at noon. Uh, if you had forgotten to sign up and you still want to come, there will be plenty of food. I would invite you to just come. Uh, we're over at the pavilion. And uh, next Friday night at 5.30, we'll be having a little party at the Parsonage for the Arinovars. So if you need the address for the Parsonage, um, 1513 Augusta Street, and uh, please come. You don't need to bring anything, just... Uh, just come. So friends, uh, I want to thank all of our worship servants this morning. Thank all of you. I know I got a little tough there. Please forgive me for that. <laughs> um, but uh, Jerry, thank you. And Pat, thank you. And Tom and Norb and Jackie and Dan and Kathy and John who provide the music for us, uh, taped uh, music for us, and grateful to all of you and grateful for all of you who are here with us this morning and those of you who are joining us online. So I invite you to stand in your, on your feet or in your heart and let us sing, Stand Up and Bless the Lord, 622, 1, 4, and 5. into a world in need, go with the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the encouragement and the power of the Holy Spirit to love God and serve others. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. 